Section 33 of the Arabian Nights Entertainment, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Scott Jones. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous. Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 33. As soon as the old lady had spoken, Zobeida took a rich diamond ring out of her casket, and putting it on her finger, and embracing her in a transport of joy, said, How infinitely am I beholden to you, my good mother! I should never have thought of so ingenious a contrivance. It cannot fail of success, and I begin to recover my peace. I leave the care of the wooden figure to you, and will go myself to order the rest." The wooden image was got ready with as much expedition as Zubaydah could have wished, and then conveyed by the old lady herself into Fetna's bedchamber, where she dressed it like a dead body, and put it into a coffin. Then Mesrur, who was himself deceived by it, caused the coffin and the representation of Fetna to be carried away, and buried with the usual ceremonies in the place appointed by Zubaydah, the favorite's women weeping and lamenting she who had given her the lemonade setting them an example by her cries and lamentations that very day zubaida sent for the architect of the palace and according to orders the mausoleum was finished in a short time such potent princesses as the consort of a monarch whose power extended from east to west are always punctually obeyed in whatsoever they command she soon put on mourning with all the court so that the news of Fetna's death was quickly spread over the city. Ghanim was one of the last who heard of it, for, as I have before observed, he hardly ever went abroad. Being, however, at length informed of it, Madam, said he to the caliph's fair favorite, you are supposed in Baghdad to be dead, and I do not question but that Zubaydah herself believes it. I bless heaven that I am the cause and the happy witness of your being alive. Would to God that, taking advantage of this false report you would share my fortune and go far from hence to reign in my heart but whither does this pleasing transport carry me i do not consider that you are born to make the greatest prince in the world happy and that only harun al rashid is worthy of you supposing you could resolve to give him up for me and that you would follow me ought i to consent no it is my part always to remember that what belongs to the master is forbidden to the slave. The lovely Fetna, though moved by the tenderness of the passion he expressed, yet prevailed with herself not to encourage it. My lord, said she to him, we cannot obstruct the momentary triumph of Zubaida. I am not surprised at the artifice she uses to conceal her guilt. But let her go on. I flatter myself that sorrow will soon follow her triumph. The caliph will return, and we shall find the means privately to inform him of all that has happened. In the meantime, let us be more cautious than ever, that she may not know that I am alive. I have already told you the consequences to be apprehended from such a discovery. At the end of three months the caliph returned to Baghdad with glory, having vanquished all his enemies. He entered the palace with impatience to embrace Fetna but was amazed to see all the officers in mourning, and his concern was redoubled when, approaching the apartment of Zubaydah, he beheld that princess coming to meet him in mourning with all her women. He immediately asked her the cause with much agitation. "'Commander of the believers,' answered Zubaydah, "'I am in mourning for your slave Fetna, who died so suddenly that it was impossible to apply any remedy to her disorder.' she would have proceeded but the caliph did not give her time being so agitated at the news that he uttered a feeble exclamation and fainted on recovering himself he with a feeble voice which sufficiently expressed his extreme grief asked where his dear fetna had been buried sir said zubaida i myself took care of her funeral and spared no cost to make it magnificent I have caused a marble mausoleum to be built over her grave, and will attend you thither, if you desire. 
The caliph would not permit Zubayda to take that trouble, but contented himself to have Masrur to conduct him. He went thither, just as he was, in his camp-dress. When he saw the tomb, the wax-lights round it, and the magnificence of the mausoleum, he was amazed that Zubayda should have performed the obsequies of her rival with so much pomp, and being naturally of a jealous temper, suspected his wife's generosity, and fancied his mistress might perhaps be yet alive, that Zubayda, taking advantage of his long absence, might have turned her out of the palace, ordering those she had entrusted to conduct her, to convey her so far off that she might never more be heard of. This was all he suspected, for he did not think Zubayda wicked enough to have attempted the life of his favorite. The better to discover the truth himself, he ordered the tomb to be removed, and caused the grave and the coffin to be opened in his presence. But when he saw the linen wrapped round the wooden image, he durst not proceed any further. This devout caliph thought it would be a sacrilegious act to suffer the body of the dead lady to be touched, and this scrupulous fear prevailed over his love and curiosity. He doubted not of Fetna's death. He caused the coffin to be shut up again, the grave to be filled, and the tomb to be made as it was before. The caliph, thinking himself obliged to pay some respect to the grave of his favorite, sent for the ministers of religion, the officers of the palace, and the readers of the Koran, and whilst they were collecting together, he remained in the mausoleum, moistening with his tears the marble that covered the phantom of his mistress. When all the persons he had sent for were come, he stood before the tomb and recited long prayers, after which the readers of the Koran read several chapters. The same ceremony was performed every day for a whole month, morning and evening, the caliph being always present, with the grand vizier and the principal officers of the court, all of them in mourning, as well as the caliph himself, who all the time ceased not to honor the memory of Fetna with his tears, and would not hear of any business. The last day of the month, the prayers and reading from the Koran lasted from morning till break of day the next morning. The caliph, being tired with sitting up so long, went to take some rest in his apartment, and fell asleep upon a sofa, between two of the court ladies, one of them sitting at the bed's head, and the other at the feet, who, while he slept, were working some embroidery, and observed a profound silence. She who sat at the bed's head, and whose name was nur nihar perceived the caliph was asleep, whispered to the other, called Nagmato Sohi, there is great news. The commander of the believers, our master, will be overjoyed when he awakes, and hears what I have to tell him. Fetna is not dead. She is in perfect health. Oh, heavens! cried Nagmato Sohi, in a transport of joy. Is it possible that the beautiful, the charming, the incomparable Fetna should still be among the living? She uttered these words with so much vivacity, and so loud, that the caliph awoke. He asked why they had disturbed his rest. Alas, my sovereign lord, answered the slave, pardon me this indiscretion. I could not, without transport, hear that Fetna is still alive. It caused such emotion in me as I could not suppress. What then is become of her, demanded the caliph, if she is not dead? Chief of the believers, replied the other, I this evening received a note from a person unknown, written with Fetna's own hand. She gives me an account of her melancholy adventure, and orders me to acquaint you with it. I thought fit, before I fulfilled my commission, to let you take some few moments rest, believing you must stand in need of it after your fatigue, and— Give me that note, said the caliph, interrupting her eagerly. You were wrong to defer delivering it to me. The slave immediately presented to him the note, which he opened with much impatience, and in it Fetna gave a particular account of all that had befallen her, but enlarged a little too much on the attentions of Ghanim. The caliph, who was naturally jealous, instead of being provoked at the inhumanity of Zubayda, was more concerned at the infidelity he fancied Fetna had been guilty of towards him. "'Is it so?' said he, after reading the note. The perfidious wretch has been four months with a young merchant, and has the effrontery to boast of his attention to her. Thirty days are past since my return to Baghdad, and she now thinks of sending me news of herself. Ungrateful creature! Whilst I spend the days in bewailing her, she passes them in betraying me. 
Go to, let us take vengeance of a bold woman, and that bold youth who affronts me. Having spoken these words, and went into a hall where he used to appear in public and give audience to his court. The first gate was opened, and immediately all the courtiers, who were waiting without, entered. The grand vizier came in, and prostrated himself before the throne. Then rising he stood before his master, who, in a tone which denoted he would be instantly obeyed, said to him, Jafir, your presence is requisite, for putting in execution an important affair I am about to commit to you. Take four hundred men of my guards with you, and first inquire where the merchant of Damascus lives, whose name is Ghanim, the son of Abu Ayyub. When you have learned this, repair to his house, and cause it to be raised to the foundations. But first secure Ghanim, and bring him hither, with my slave Fetna, who has lived with him these four months. I will punish her, and make an example of that insolent man, who has presumed to fail in respect to me. The Grand Vizier, having received this positive command, made a low prostration to the Caliph, having his hand on his head, in token that he would rather lose it than disobey him, and departed. The first thing he did was to send to the syndic of the dealers in foreign stuffs and silks, with strict orders to find out the house of the unfortunate merchant. The officer he sent with these orders brought him back word that he had scarcely been seen for some months, and no man knew what could keep him at home if he was there. The same officer likewise told Jafir where Ghanim lived. Upon this information, that minister, without losing time, went to the judge of the police, whom he caused to bear him company and attended by a great number of carpenters and masons with the necessary tools for raising a house, came to Ghanim's residence, and finding it stood detached from any other, he posted his soldiers round it to prevent the young merchants making his escape. Fetna and Ghanim had just dined. The lady was sitting at a window next to the street. Hearing a noise, she looked out through the lattice, and seeing the Grand Vizier, approach with his attendants, concluded she was the object as well as Ghanim. She perceived her note had been received, but had not expected such a consequence, having hoped that the Caliph would have taken the matter in a different light. She knew not how long the prince had been returned from his campaign, and though she was acquainted with his jealous temper, yet apprehended nothing on that account. However, the sight of the Grand Vizier and the soldiers made her tremble, not indeed for herself, but for Ghanim. She did not question clearing herself, provided the Caliph would but hear her. As for Ghanim, whom she loved less out of gratitude than inclination, she plainly foresaw that his incensed rival might be apt to condemn him on account of his youth and person. Full of this thought, she turned to the young merchant and said, Alas, Ghanim, we are undone. Ghanim looked through the lattice, and was seized with dread when he beheld the caliph's guards with their naked scimitars, and the grand vizier with the civil magistrate at the head of them. At this sight he stood motionless, and had not power to utter one word. Ghanim, said the favorite, there is no time to be lost. If you love me, put on the habit of one of your slaves immediately, and disfigure your face and arms with soot. Then put some of these dishes on your head. You may be taken for a servant belonging to the eating-house, and they will let you pass. If they happen to ask you where the master of the house is, answer without any hesitation that he is within. Alas, madam, answered Ghanim, concerned for himself more than Fetna, you only take care of me. What will become of you? Let not that trouble you, replied Fetna. It is my part to look to that. As for what you leave in this house, I will take care of it, and I hope it will faithfully be restored to you when the caliph's anger shall be over. But at present avoid his fury. The orders he gives in the heat of passion are always fatal. The young merchant's affliction was so great that he knew not what course to pursue, and he would certainly have suffered himself to be seized by the caliph's soldiers had not Fetna pressed him to disguise himself. He submitted to her persuasions, put on the habit of a slave, daubed himself with soot, and as they were knocking at the door, all they could do was embrace each other tenderly. They were both so overwhelmed with sorrow that they could not utter a word. Thus they parted. Ghanim went out with some dishes on his head. He was taken for the servant of an eating-house, and no one offered to stop him. On the contrary, the Grand Vizier, who was the first that met him, 
gave way and let him pass, little thinking that he was the man he looked for. Those who were behind the Grand Vizier made way as he had done, and thus favoured his escape. He soon reached one of the gates, and got clear of the city. While she was making the best of his way from the Grand Vizier, that minister came into the room where Fetna was sitting on a sofa, and where there were many chests full of Ghanim's clothes, and of the money he had made of his goods. As soon as Fetna saw the Grand Vizier come into the room, she fell upon her face, and continuing in that posture, as it were to receive her death. "'My lord,' said she, "'I am ready to undergo the sentence passed against me by the commander of the believers. You need only make it known to me.' "'Madam,' answered Jafir, falling also down till she had raised herself, "'God forbid any man should presume to lay profane hands on you. I do not intend to offer you the least harm. I have no farther orders than to entreat you will be pleased to go with me to the palace, and to conduct you thither, with the merchant that lives in this house. My lord, replied the favorite, let us go. I am ready to follow you. As for the young merchant, to whom I am indebted for my life, he is not here. He has been gone about a month since, to Damascus, whither his business called him and has left these chests you see under my care till he returns i conjure you to cause them to be carried to the palace and order them to be secured that i may perform the promise i made him to take all possible care of them you shall be obeyed said jaffier and immediately sent for porters whom he commanded to take up the chests and carry them to mesrur as soon as the porters were gone he whispered the civil magistrate committing to him the care of seeing the house raised but first to cause diligent search to be made for ghanim who he suspected might be hidden notwithstanding what fetna had told him he then went out taking her with him attended by the two slaves who waited on her as for ghanim's slaves they were not regarded they ran in among the crowd and it was not known what became of them no sooner was Jafir out of the house than the masons and carpenters began to demolish it, and did their business so effectively that in a few hours none of it remained. But the civil magistrate, not finding Ghanim, after the strictest search, sent to acquaint the Grand Vizier before that minister reached the palace. "'Well,' said Harun al-Rashid, seeing him come into his closet, "'have you executed my orders?' yes answered jaffier the house ghanim lived in is levelled with the ground and i have brought you your favourite fetna she is at your closet door and i will call her in if you command me as for the young merchant we could not find him though every place has been searched and fetna affirms that he has been gone a month to damascus never was passion equal to that of the caliph when he heard that ghanim had made his escape as for his favorite, believing that she had been false to him, he would neither see nor speak to her. Mesrur, said he to the chief of the eunuchs, who was then present, take the ungrateful and perfidious Fetna, and shut her up in the dark tower. That tower was within the precinct of the palace, and commonly served as a prison for the favorites who any way offended the caliph. Mesrur, being used to execute his sovereign's orders, however unjust, without making any answer, obeyed this with some reluctance. He signified his concern to Fetna, who was the more grieved, because she had assured herself that the caliph would not refuse to speak to her. She was obliged to submit to her hard fate, and to follow Mesrur, who conducted her to the dark tower, and there left her. In the meantime, the enraged caliph dismissed his grand vizier, and only hearkening to his passion, wrote the following letter with his own hand to the king of Syria, his cousin and tributary, who resided at Damascus. This letter is to inform you that a merchant of Damascus, whose name is Ghanim, the son of Abu Ayyub, has seduced the most amiable of my women slaves, called Fetna, and is fled. It is my will that when you have read my letter, you cause search to be made for Ghanim, and secure him. When he is in your power, you shall cause him to be loaded with irons, and for three days successively let him receive fifty strokes of the bastinado. Then let him be led through all the parts of the city by a crier, proclaiming, This is the smallest punishment the commander of the believers inflicts on him that offends his lord, and debauches one of his slaves. After that you shall send him to me under a strong guard. 
It is my will that you cause his house to be plundered, and after it has been raised, order the materials to be carried out of the city into the middle of the plain. Besides this, if he has father, mother, sister, wives, daughters, or other kindred, cause them to be stripped, and when they are naked, expose them three days to the whole city, forbidding any person on pain of death to afford them shelter. I expect you will, without delay, execute my command. The caliph, having written this letter, dispatched it by an express, ordering him to make all possible speed, and to take pigeons with him, that he might the sooner hear what had been done by Muhammad Zanabi. The pigeons of Baghdad have this peculiar quality, that from wherever they may be carried to, they return to Baghdad as soon as they are set at liberty, especially when they have young ones. A letter rolled up is made fast under their wing, and by that means advice is speedily received from such places as it is desired. The caliph's courier travelled night and day, as his master's impatience required, and being come to Damascus, went directly to King Zinebi's palace, who sat upon his throne to receive the caliph's letter. The courier having delivered it, Muhammad, looking at it, and knowing the hand, stood up to show his respect, kissed the letter, and laid it on his head to denote he was ready submissively to obey the orders it contained. He opened it, and having read it, immediately descended from his throne, and without losing time mounted on horseback with the principal officers of his household. He sent for the civil magistrate, and went directly to Ghanim's house, attended by all his guards. Ghanim's mother had never received any letters from him since he had left Damascus, but the other merchants with whom he went to Baghdad were returned, and all of them told her they had left her son in perfect health. However, seeing he did not return, she could not but be persuaded that he was dead, and was so fully convinced of this in her imagination that she went into mourning. She bewailed Ghanim as if she had seen him die, and had herself closed his eyes. Never mother expressed greater sorrow, and so far was she from seeking any comfort that she delighted in indulging her grief. She had caused a dome to be built in the middle of the court belonging to her house, in which she placed a tomb. She spent the greatest part of the days and nights in weeping under that dome, as if her son had been buried there. Her daughter bore her company, and mixed her tears with hers. It was now some time since they had thus devoted themselves to sorrow, and the neighborhood, hearing their cries and lamentations, pitied such tender relations. When the king, Mohammed Zinebi, knocked at the door, which being opened by a slave belonging to the family, he hastily entered the house, inquiring for Ghanim, the son of Abu Ayyub. Though the slave had never seen King Zinebi, she guessed by his retinue that he must be one of the principal officers of Damascus. "'My lord,' said she, "'that Ghanim you inquire for is dead. My mistress, his mother, is in that monument, lamenting him.' The king, not regarding what was said by the slave, caused all the house to be diligently searched by his guards for Ghanim. He then advanced towards the monument, where he saw the mother and daughter sitting on a mat, and their faces appeared to him bathed in tears. These poor women immediately veiled themselves as soon as they beheld a man at the door of the dome. But the mother, knowing the king of Damascus, got up and ran to cast herself at his feet. "'My good lady,' said he, "'I was looking for your son Ghanim. Is he here?' "'Alas, sir,' cried the mother, "'it is a long time since he has ceased to be. Would to God I had at least put him into his coffin with my own hands, and had had the comfort of having his bones in this monument.' "'Oh, my son, my dear son!' She would have said more, but was oppressed with such violent sorrow that she was unable to proceed. Zinebi was moved, for he was a prince of a mild nature, and had much compassion for the sufferings of the unfortunate. "'If Ghanim alone be guilty,' thought he to himself, "'why should the mother and the daughter, who are innocent, be punished? "'Ah, cruel Harun al-Rushid!' What a mortification do you put upon me in making me the executioner of your vengeance, obliging me to persecute persons who have not offended you? The guards whom the king had ordered to search for Ghanim came and told him their search had been in vain. He was fully convinced of this. The tears of those two women would not leave him any room to doubt. It distracted him to be obliged to execute the caliph's order. 
"'My good lady,' said he to Ganem's mother, "'quit this monument with your daughter. It is no place of safety for you.' They went out, and he, to secure them against any insult, took off his own robe, and covered them both with it, bidding them keep close to him. He then ordered the populace to be let in to plunder, which was performed with the utmost rapaciousness, and with shouts which terrified Ganem's mother and sister the more, because they knew not the reason. The rabble carried off the richest goods, chests full of wealth, fine Persian and Indian carpets, cushions covered with cloth of gold and silver, fine chinaware. In short, all was taken away, till nothing remained but the bare walls of the house, and it was a dismal spectacle for these unhappy ladies to see all their goods plundered, without knowing why they were so cruelly treated. When the house was plundered, Mohammed ordered the civil magistrate to raise the house and monument, and while that was doing, he carried away the mother and daughter to his palace. There it was he redoubled their affliction by acquainting them with the caliph's will. He commands me, said he to them, to cause you to be stripped and exposed naked for three days to the view of the people. It is with the utmost reluctance that I execute such a cruel and ignominious sentence." The king delivered these words with such an air as plainly made it appear his heart was really pierced with grief and compassion. Though the fear of being dethroned prevented his following the dictates of his pity, yet he in some measure moderated the rigor of the caliph's orders by causing large shifts without sleeves to be made of coarse horsehair for Ghanim's mother and his sister. The next day these two victims of the caliph's rage were stripped of their clothes, and their horsehair shifts put upon them. Their headdress was also taken away, so that their disheveled hair hung floating on their backs. The daughter had the finest hair, and it hung down to the ground. In this condition they were exposed to the people. The civil magistrate, attended by his officers, were along with them, and they were conducted through the city. A crier went before them who every now and then cried, This is the punishment due to those who have drawn on themselves the indignation of the commander of the believers. Whilst they walked in this manner, along the streets of Damascus, with their arms and feet naked, clad in such a strange garment, and endeavoring to hide their confusion under their hair, with which they covered their faces, all the people were dissolved in tears. More especially the ladies, considering them as innocent persons, as they beheld them through their lattice windows, and being particularly moved by the daughters' youth and beauty, they made the air ring with their shrieks as they passed before their houses. The very children, frightened at those shrieks and at the spectacle that occasioned them, mixed their cries with the general lamentation. In short, had an enemy been in Damascus putting all to fire and sword, the consternation could not have been greater. It was near night when this dismal scene concluded. The mother and daughter were both conducted back to King Mohammed's palace. Not being used to walk barefoot, they were so spent that they lay a long time in a swoon. The queen of Damascus, highly afflicted at their misfortunes, notwithstanding the caliph's prohibition to relieve them, sent some of her women to comfort them with all sorts of refreshments and wine to recover their spirits. The queen's women found them still in a swoon, and almost past receiving any benefit by what they offered them. However, with much difficulty, they were brought to themselves. Ghanim's mother immediately returned them thanks for their courtesy. "'My good madam,' said one of the queen's ladies to her, "'we are highly concerned at your affliction, and the queen of Syria, our mistress, has done us a favor in employing us to assist you. We can assure you that princess is much afflicted at your misfortunes, as well as the king, her consort. Ghanem's mother entreated the queen's women to return her majesty a thousand thanks for her and her daughter, and then directing her discourse to the lady who spoke to her, Madam, said she, the king has not told me why the chief of the believers inflicts so many outrages on us. Pray be pleased to tell us what crimes we have been guilty of. My good lady, answered the other, the origin of your misfortunes proceeds from your son Ghanem. He is not dead, as you imagine. He is accused of having seduced the beautiful Fetna, the best beloved of the caliph's favorites. But, having by flight withdrawn himself from that prince's indignation, the punishment is fallen on you. All condemn the caliph's resentment, but all fear him. 
and you see King Zanebi himself dares not resist his orders, for fear of incurring his displeasure. All we can do is to pity you, and exhort you to have patience. I know my son, answered Ghanim's mother. I have educated him carefully, and in that respect which is due to the commander of the believers. He cannot have committed the crime which he is accused of. I dare answer for his innocence. But I will cease to murmur and complain, since it is for him that I suffer, and he is not dead. O oh, Ghanim, added she in a transport of affection and joy, my dear son Ghanim, is it possible that you are still alive? I am no longer concerned for the loss of my fortune. And how harsh and unjust soever the caliph's orders may be, I forgive him, provided heaven has preserved my son. I am only concerned for my daughter. Her sufferings alone afflict me, yet I believe her to be so good a sister as to follow my example. On hearing these words, the young lady, who till then had appeared insensible, turned to her mother, and clasping her arms about her neck, "'Yes, dear mother,' said she, "'I will always follow your example, whatever extremity your love for my brother may reduce us to.' The mother and daughter, thus interchanging their sighs and tears, continued a considerable time in such moving embraces. In the meantime, the queen's women, who were much affected at the spectacle, omitted no persuasions to prevail with Ghanim's mother to take some sustenance. She ate a morsel out of complacence, and her daughter did the like. The caliph, having ordered that Ghanim's kindred should be exposed three days successively to the sight of the people in the condition already mentioned, the unhappy ladies afforded the same spectacle the second time next day, from morning till night. But that day and the following, the streets, which at first had been full of people, were now quite empty. All the merchants, incensed at the ill usage of Abu Ayyub's widow and daughter, shut up their shops and kept themselves close within their houses. The ladies, instead of looking through their lattice windows, withdrew into the back parts of their houses. There was not a person to be seen in the public places through which those unfortunate women were carried. It seemed as if all the inhabitants of Damascus had abandoned their city. On the fourth day, the king resolving punctually to obey the caliph's orders, though he did not approve of them, sent criers into all quarters of the city to make proclamation, strictly commanding all the inhabitants of Damascus, and strangers, of what condition soever, upon pain of death, and having their bodies cast to the dogs to be devoured, not to receive Ghanim's mother and sister into their houses, or give them a morsel of bread, or a drop of water, and, in a word, not to afford them the least support, or hold the least correspondence with them. When the criers had performed what the king had enjoined them, that prince ordered the mother and the daughter to be turned out of the palace, and left to their choice to go where they thought fit. As soon as they appeared, all persons fled from them, so great an impression had the late prohibition made upon all. They easily perceived that everybody shunned them, but not knowing the reason, were much surprised, and their amazement was the greater when coming into any street or among any persons they recollected some of their best friends who immediately retreated with as much haste as the rest what is the meaning of this said ganem's mother do we carry the plague about us must the unjust and barbarous usage we have received render us odious to our fellow-citizens come child added she let us depart from damascus with all speed let us not stay any longer in a city where we are become frightful to our very friends. The two wretched ladies, discoursing in this manner, came to one of the extremities of the city, and retired to a ruined house to pass the night. Thither some Mussulmans, out of charity and compassion, resorted to them after the day was shut in. They carried them provisions, but durst not stay to comfort them, for fear of being discovered, and punished for disobeying the caliph's orders. In the meantime King Zanebi had let fly a pigeon to give the caliph an account of his exact obedience. He informed him of all that had been executed, and conjured him to direct what he would have done with Ghanim's mother and sister. He soon received the caliph's answer in the same way, which was, that he should banish them from Damascus forever. Immediately the king of Syria sent men to the old house, with orders to take the mother and daughter, 
and to conduct them three days' journey from Damascus, and there to leave them, forbidding them ever to return to the city. Zenebi's men executed their commission, but being less exact than their master in the strict performance of the caliph's orders, they, in pity, gave the wretched ladies some small pieces of money, and each of them a scrip, which they hung about their necks to carry their provisions. End of section 33 Recording by John Scott Jones, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, June 29, 2007